Okay, I think we're good now. So it looks like we are able to screen share. There we go. Okay, we back. Sorry about the technical difficulties, guys. Let's go ahead and dive in, okay? I'm still just, my mind is boggled that like I do this every day and I set it up the same way every day and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It's like if I connect to reflector and then it like goes into sleep mode, it like can never connect again, no matter how many, how much we do. That's okay. We can lose viewers. Um, okay. So let's start with emotions. Okay. So this is what we're talking about today. So we're going to start off actually by thinking a little bit about behavior and how we work. So a lot of times, um, we're going to dip a little bit into mechanics of mind. So a lot of times we make decisions, right? But then the question is, what goes into decisions? So like, what are the components of decisions? So sometimes even if something is rational, it may not, it, just because something is, is rational doesn't mean that it is actually that you do that thing. So you're, even if you, something is rationally a good idea, it doesn't necessarily mean that you do it. So what are the three things that kind of go into decision-making? One is rational, and there are habits and other stuff that we're not going to uh, get to today, but uh, these are essentially components of the mind. So even if you know something is good rationally, you may have an emotion that keeps you from doing it. So a good example of this is social anxiety. So let's say that like in social anxiety, you know, rationally, you can say everyone likes me because they're your friends, right? So let's assume that you're going out with your friends. Um, and then, but your emotions say no one likes me. Okay. And the third thing that makes decisions for you, the third part of your mind is your ego or sense of identity. But then this, then you have this kind of thought. I am an unlikable person. And so these are, uh, I mean, the other kind of emotional thought is like, the other way to think about this is this may not even be a thought necessarily. It's just, you know, a sense of fear or worry. So this, this could actually be an ego, ego statement as well. The point here is that like, these are the three things that happen, right? So you have like physical sensations of anxiety. You have kind of just this emotional, you have like a pit in your stomach or you have sweaty palms or things like that. And so all three of these things are in conflict. And so a big problem is that, you know, when, when I work with people on, on technology, social media, gamers, et cetera, they say, I know what, I need to do, but I just can't do it, right? You know you need to study. You know you need to apply for a job. So this part is set. <coughs> but the question is, this is insufficient to get you guys to do what you need to do. And so the question is like, what do we do about that? Right? Like I can sit here and then like the problem is that you th like when you think about your problem solving strategy here, you focus on number one, rationality, number two, rationality, and number three, rationality, right? Number four, maybe you work on habit, five, willpower. You can do all kinds of stuff over here, actually. But most of the arguing that you do with yourself is in your head and is on an intellectual level. But that's kind of insufficient because the problem actually is not here. The problem is here or here. And we don't really get trained to deal with these two things. So today, what we're going to talk about is emotions, okay? So question is, if you're unable to do what you want to, chances are... Um, it's not the rational that's holding you guys back because in my experience, most like gamers and like, you know, people tend to be smart. It's not an issue of IQ. 
it's an issue of like not understanding that there are things holding you back in your mind that are irrational because if it, you know, th those are, those are emotions. So, so then let's think about, you know, why are, why is it hard to deal with emotions? Oh, okay. So why are emotions hard to deal with? So the first reason is because most of us are alexithymic. And alexithymia is the inability to determine your internal emotional state. So a lot of gamers that I talk to say that they're in control of their emotions. They feel like they're in control of their emotions. And when I kind of ask them, like, what do you mean by that? And they'll say, like, okay, so so give me an example of being in control. They're saying, like, I can watch a sad movie and I won't cry. I can watch a scary movie and I won't feel scared. Um, I, I, like, tend to be, you know, like, uh, emotions don't affect me. I can go to a funeral and, like, I'll be sad, but I'm not going to be, like, crying like other people. And so what they mean by in control, you're not really in control of your emotions. You're just suppressing them. And the interesting thing about emotions is if we look at the brain, our emotions, essentially we can turn up the volume or down the volume on our emotions. So suppression affects all emotions. So if we look at like gamers, this is also why they don't feel that positivity. Like they look at other people and they're like, wow, that person really has a zest for life. I don't have a zest for life. I feel kind of stuck. I feel like a lack of fulfillment. And part of that is because, you know, imagine there are different like channels, right? So there are different Twitch channels you can watch. But if Twitch is muted, it doesn't matter what kind of Twitch channel you're watching. You're not going to be able to hear what, you know, what they're saying. You're going to get like just a fraction of what other people are capable of feeling because your emotions are just turned all the way down. And so the question is, why do we suppress our emotions and or why are our emotions suppressed? So then the question is, why suppression? And there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that it's adaptive and protective. So a lot of gamers will have various things that happen to them when they're young, that, that the emotions hurt. And when you're young, unless you have someone who can help you navigate those emotions, you're going to learn how to suppress them, especially through video games. So let's say a good example is you get bullied you know, you have abusive, neglectful parents is another good one, or people around you. And then even if you don't get bullied and you don't have abusive or neglectful parents, you have parents that talk about your potential <laughs> and how smart you are. And then this actually makes you feel what, right? It makes you feel bad unless it makes you feel good and the question is what 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 is this bad it makes you feel shame it makes you feel fear that you can't live up to expectation And so then the question is like, when they tell you you're such a smart kid, so like it, the odd thing is that even parents can be sort of like loving and kind. It's just love is not a substitute for like emotional competence, right? They can be supportive or do what they think is supportive and it can still place a burden on you. This is why like we all have kind of little emotional traumas or psychological complexes or some scars. And it doesn't mean that our parents did a bad job. It just means that we weren't taught how to deal with them, like deal with the what they did to us and what they did to our psyche. So if we think about it, like we don't want to feel this. So what we end up doing is all of this results in suppression. Because if you suppress, then it goes away. So how do we suppress? Okay. First is video games. So there are studies that show 
that when you play a video game, it does a couple of interesting things. There are um, there the two parts of the brain that are sort of govern emotional uh, and especially a negative emotional experience are the amygdala and hippocampus. Okay. So when we're feeling bad, these two parts of our brain are like kind of lit up. And let's do this. So these two parts of our brain are lit up whenever we're feeling bad. And then when we play a video game, there's studies that show that the activity in these regions actually end up getting the, the, the activity goes down. So when we play video games, these turn off. And when we spend a lot of time playing video games, we learn how to turn these, these things off and they, they start to turn off all the time. We also suppress the rest of our emotions. So we kind of get that dopaminergic satisfaction from playing a video game. So it's kind of like rewarding and addictive, but it doesn't make you feel happy or excited. Do you guys get that? So video games reward us without necessarily like creating positive emotion. So there, there are like moments of positive emotion in video games, right? Like you, you can like win a, a match of like, let's say you're, you're down in League of Legends or something and then you guys make a comeback and then you feel like excitement at the end. And there's, there is somewhat of an emotional roller coaster when you play those games. There's also a lot of rage and toxicity that bubbles up. And if you think about it, like if you don't really care about a game of League of Legends, like why is it that you feel so frustrated or toxic or angry with your teammates? It's because you have this gigantic pile of emotions that are like that you've been suppressing for a while and it starts to come out. So if we really look at video games, what they actually train us to do is suppress our emotions. That's neurologically like what they do to our brains. They just turn off those parts of our body. And then what happens is like if a, if a part of our body is turned off, if we shut off a part of our brain, we lose competence with that part. Okay, so let's think about this. Like good examples of this are forgetting a language. Other things are like, you know, just skill decay in general. Like whether it's like learning to, forgetting to play music or, or you know, forgetting certain information or knowledge. And remember that the brain is an efficient organ. So if it's not using something, it's going to like stop prioritizing it. So over time as video games or other forms of like social media or technology, suppress our emotions, suppress our emotions, suppress our emotions. Um, then we like forget, we don't understand what we're feeling. Another important part about suppression is kind of cultural. So there's a cultural impact. And what do I mean by that? And maybe actually, if we think about it, what I should do is this. Take this, move it down here. Okay. I'm going to take this, move it up here. So this is a second. So why do we suppress? Because of a cultural impact too. So men are taught to suppress most emotions, right? So if you think about the traditional like guy's locker room, right? Like we don't express shame or fear. We're basically taught to only express one emotion, which is anger. And so like, you know, when, when, when you get rejected by a girl, if you say like, yeah, I'm, if you tell your bros that you're like, yeah, I'm afraid that I'm never going to be loved and that like no one will ever love me. Like no dude says that, right? When you get, when you ask a girl out and she says no, that's not what you say because you don't even understand that you feel that. Like you feel some sense of badness and then you get pissed and you're like, yeah, fuck her. You know, like, and then your bros are like, they're completely fine and they get like toxic and they're like, yeah, like she sucks. Like, forget about her, man. Like, you're better than that. Like all this kind of language, but we don't talk about what you actually feel. 
So we suppress fear, shame, you know, all these kinds of other emotions. Like we even suppress sadness. Like you don't tell your friend like, Hey, yeah, man, I'm, I'm feeling like super sad today. You're, you know, what, what, what we do is we like, so we detect these emotions within each other. We recognize them. And oftentimes men use physical language to express emotion. So we don't know, like, we don't know these words. These are like questionable to us, but physical language we're very familiar with. Like, how did it feel when she dumped you, man? Felt like a kick in the nuts. And you say that and then all your, your like guy friends are like, yeah, man, I know exactly what you mean, right? When you saw her for the first time, how did she make you feel? I felt butterflies in my stomach, right? So that's like a physical representation of all kinds of emotions, apprehension, excitement, vulnerability, right? This is one that especially men don't talk about. You feel vulnerable, you feel exposed. There are all kinds of emotions that go into this. You just don't know what they are. And so this kind of like this, leads to a big problem because not only are games reinforcing our brain to not experience or understand emotion, but then we also have like all of these physical sensations because the emotion is gonna come out in some way. So your body is psychosomatic. And what I mean by that is that your mind and your body are connected. And so like physical, th mental representations are gonna have physical effects and physical effects are gonna have mental representations. And what do I mean by that? Like if you're sick mentally, how, like if you have the flu, Mentally, how do you feel? You feel crappy, right? Mentally, you feel crappy. You don't feel interested in things. Things aren't quite as fun. Like you don't even like anger and irritability and stuff like that is going to all kind of be suppressed. And on the flip side, if you're mentally not feeling well, that's going to manifest with, okay, where is, where is the rest of my family? <laughs> There's the family. Can you close the door? Thanks, hon. Um, so, <laughs> so what was I saying? Yeah. So mentally you're going to have physical representations too. So if you feel anxious, like you have, if you have worried thoughts in your head, the other day when we talked about anxiety, we didn't really talk about physical anxiety, but it's going to have physical sens sensations, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Where are my teammates is right. And, uh, so these two things are intrinsically linked and men tend to experience a lot of emotion physically. Like if I ask someone, what emotions are you feeling right now? They're going to say, I don't know. But if I ask them physically, what do you say? They're going to, they're going to definitely be able to say things like pit in my stomach. Tightness in my chest. etc. And then oftentimes on stream or after meditation, I'll ask them what happened to the pin in your stomach? What happened to the tightness in your chest? And people will feel better. It'll feel less. So we're actually going to hang on to this. We're going to bring it down. Okay. And now we're going to go to the next. Start. So then the question is how, so the first thing that we've got to do, so let's Assume that all this is true, right? So let's go back to this for a second. And remember that our goal here is to make better decisions or not make better decisions, to implement better decisions. And so if we think about what's keeping us from implementation, it is actually, it's not that rationally we don't know what to do. It's that emotionally we're not sure what to do or like our emotions are controlling part of, part of our behavior. So that's why this is important. So the first thing to understand is that why is it hard for us to function emotionally? And that's because we're alexithymic. We literally like, it's hard to control something or deal with something if you don't know what it is or where it is. So the first thing to understand is that we're alexithymic, which means that we don't understand what our emotions are. And if we don't understand what they are, you can't do anything about it because good diagnosis precedes good treatment. Actually, there are some things you can do, but it's, it's ineffective. Um, it's not like a long-term strategy. And so why are we alexithymic? That has to do with 
uh, a lot of our brain and using some technological tools that create suppression. And the more our brain gets suppressed, the more we become colorblind to our internal emotional state. We're also, for the most part, especially men more so than women, are culturally like taught to not understand or express their emotions. So not only do we have technology, but we also have this cultural impact and that results in our, our feelings of alexithymia. So then the question is, what do we do about it, right? Fine, Dr. K, I accept everything you're saying. What do I do about alexithymia? It's allergies, not COVID, guys. Don't worry. So the first thing is to recognize that you are feeling an emotion. We're not even going to try to define it yet. The first thing that you've got to do is figure out, oh, there are, like a, there are emotions at play here, okay? There are some things that you can do to clue yourself in why is this not? That emotions are at play. And what are those things? Okay. So the first thing is physical sensations. So let's say you're waiting for like a job interview or you wake up one day and you know that your parents are going to call and you feel stuff. Okay. That's why I've been hanging on to all that for all this time. So the first thing is physical sensations. <laughs> So if you start to feel physical sensations, understand that there is an emotional equivalent. So this is a clue that you're feeling something. So then you can go look for it, right? So we can leverage our rational mind to hypothesize what we could be feeling. Okay. The second thing that the second clue is umbrella terms. And what do I mean by that? We have ways of conveying in general that we don't feel good. Stressed. Frustrated. Overwhelmed. And unfortunately nowadays, anxious. An anxiety has become a catch-all term for all kinds of emotions now. It's not even necessarily worry. And so a lot of times, since we don't have the resolution to capture the emotion, we're aware that we feel stressed, but like, what does that even mean? Like, what does it mean to feel stressed? Like, what is the emotion that you're experiencing when you're stressed? And there are all kinds of things. There could, could be like uncertainty around the future. There could be fear that you're going to fail. You're, you're going to lose your job. There could be um, concern that people are going to ostracize you. There are all kinds of things, right? You could be pissed off at someone. You could be ashamed about something like, oh, everyone's going to find out that you're an imposter. All of these things, like, like you say that you're stressed and then you, someone asks you, how's work going? And you say work sucks. Sucks is another good one, right? What does that mean? Like what's bad about work? What is the negative emotion that work causes you to experience? Is it a, is it a sense that you are being taken advantage of? Is it that you are victimized? Is it that you feel powerless? Is it that you feel hopeless? There are all kinds of things that, that could make work suck, but we don't understand. So this, the first thing that we've got to do is recognize when we're feeling emotion. And these are our clues. So step one is recognize that you're feeling an emotion. Step two is try to diagnose that emotion. Okay. And so then what we do is we say like, okay, we, we take something like stress and then we're going to hypothesize. So you can do something like, you, you know, you can ask yourself, okay, about shame, fear, anger, sadness. Um, what else? Hope or hopelessness. Feelings of power or agency or powerlessness, right? 
any of this stuff could be going on. And then like literally go down the list and then ask yourself. So I do this on stream and you guys may grieve. That's another good one, right? So regret that is another good one. There are all kinds of, um, yeah. So, so, and then someone's saying that frustration is a lower form of anger. I completely agree. So frustration is like mini anger. And then another one, oh, this is another umbrella term, embarrassment is usually shame, right? So we have like lighter versions. We've got the diet version of shame, which is embarrassment. We've got the diet version of anger, which is frustration. Um, and so like you, if you're feeling stressed out, you just literally, you ask yourself, Are you feeling any of these? And you can like literally just go through the list. And then if that doesn't work, there's even another option that you can do. So this is one thing that you can do. If that doesn't work, you can ask yourself, what would someone in my situation feel and the crazy thing is that we're way better at asking this question okay and this has to do with us being sort of more cognitively empathic than emotionally empathic two kinds of empathy cognitive empathy and emotional empathy emotional empathy is what we sort of think of as regular empathy like you're someone who has a lot of empathy um, but then there's another kind of empathy which is cognitive so it's not that you actually feel what other people are feeling it's that you can rationalize or analyze what someone else would be feeling. So you can like sort of analytically predict emotions, but you don't actually feel them. And so if you ask yourself, what would someone else in my situation feel? Like if someone was applying for a promotion and they, they may not get it because there were two other candidates who maybe are more qualified, how would they feel? They'd feel maybe ashamed, they'd feel hopeless, they'd feel powerless. And so if you ask yourself what someone else would be feeling, you can get like, you can check off a couple things. Oh, maybe it's this one. Maybe it's this one. Maybe it's this one. Maybe they feel regret because they could have worked harder earlier. There are all kinds of things. Okay. So then once you sort of figure out, okay, like maybe I'm feeling shame. Maybe I'm feeling hope. Maybe I'm feeling power, uh, powerlessness. Then the question is, How do I deal with it? Okay. So now the question is like, okay, let's say you go through this process and you understand that you're lexithymic and you figure out, okay, maybe this, this is what I'm feeling. How do we actually check this box so that your decisions aren't as impacted by your emotions? So the short answer is that you have to process it. So I want you guys to recognize that like in your decision-making process, we have rational thoughts minus emotions. And then let's say plus minus ego equals decision, right? Or not even decision, maybe actually action is maybe better. And so what that means is that like, you can increase this variable as much as you want to, right? But if this variable is like, you want to decrease this and then your action will be what you want. In the case of negative emotions, the opposite is also true, right? We can have emotions like head over heels in love minus rational thought. plus minus ego equals action. So this is also true, right? So head over heels in love is the emotion. And then the rational thought is person is not good <laughs> for me, right? We can think these things too. And this is absolutely a common occurrence. But my point is that these two things are oftentimes opposed. 
And then sometimes they're not opposed, right? And when they're not opposed, then action becomes very easy. So when your, your rational mind and your emotional mind are aligned, if your ego is also aligned or your identity is aligned, then action becomes easy. And this is the thing that I want you guys to understand. Like a big part of what I advocate for. So people think that you need, remember y'all solution is this. This is a crappy solution in my opinion. Like sure habits are good, sure willpower is good. But what I'm saying is just make the decision easier for yourself by reducing this variable. If you reduce the impact of this or you reduce the impact of this, then your decision making process is going to get way easier. It's just going to like you don't need willpower if your emotions and your rational thought are aligned. So if you digest your emotions, like decisions just start to become easy for you. Like it's just easy. I don't know how else to describe it. It's just easy. So, for example, when my kid walks in, I experience different emotions. I experience some amount of joy and I experience some amount of frustration. And whether I let those emotions control me or not depends on my awareness of those emotions. So if I just recognize and I'm like, okay, um, you know, like I'm feeling a little bit annoyed. And then like that thing loses power over me. Okay. So how do we process it? So the question is, how does this happen? How? So the first thing is awareness. And this is because awareness precedes control. You cannot control that which you are unaware of. Just think about that for a second, okay? If you've ever had dental work done and you've had your mouth numbed up, your control over the numb parts of your mouth just goes out the window. Like you can try to control it. You can sort of move your tongue around, but like your capacity to control it properly and not bite your tongue if your tongue is numb, like you can sort of roughly direct it, but you lose all of your fine like motor capability. You lose all of your precision. So I want you guys to realize that you're moving through life without any kind of emotional like control, uh, emotional precision or any control like that is precise over your emotions. So your emotions are just running amok within you. And as your emotions start to run amok and they're just doing whatever the hell they want to, then the only solution that you know how to do is just turn it off, right? It's like if I can't control like what direction, like let's say I turn on a garden hose and there's a lot of water coming out of the garden hose, the garden hose is going all over the place. And this is how you feel like when you try to ask a girl out or you go, you apply for a job or your parents ask you how you're doing or whatever. Like there are all kinds of situations that just turn up the emotional knob. And then there's a garden hose that's like just flopping all around, getting everything wet. And the only solution you have is to turn the water off. You go and you play a video game. And so you're just like, oh my God, I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this. Like I'm going to go home and I'm going to play a video game. That's all you can do. So you have to become aware, right? You have to understand where the garden hose is. You have to understand where, you know, when the water is coming out and like, just think about this for a second. How easy is it to control the water out of a garden hose if you're holding it with three fingers, right? The amount of effort that's required to actually control the water flow out of a garden hose is minimal, provided you're actually holding it in the right place, right? Like, does that make sense to you guys? It's like, it's actually quite easy. You just need precision. And this kind of comes back to this. Like, I don't like it when people use willpower because willpower is an imprecise solution. I don't know what the, I don't know what the analogy is, is with the garden hose. I'm just saying that like controlling something once you're aware of it and you understand how to hold it properly becomes very, very easy. Um, and so that's what I really think you guys should focus on. So the first thing is to become aware of and as crazy as this sounds, this accounts for like, do I actually write out like, honestly, between 25 and 40% in my estimation, just being aware of something accounts for 25 to 40%. In some cases, some believe that this is sufficient for 100%. I think over time it is like right now, when I, when I felt my emotions, I just felt them and then they went away. Oh, you acknowledge it and it's gone. So once you train yourself, it can get close to 100%. But let's start with it's going to at the beginning account for 25 to 40%. And I know that's crazy. All you need to know is what the problem is. And you can think about that. Like, you know, awareness precedes control is another uh, example of diagnosis precedes treatment. And I say this all the time, and I think it's a beautiful lesson to learn from medicine. 
is that it's hard to treat a disease that you've improperly diagnosed. And so like diagnosis is half the battle, like treatment afterward, it becomes relatively easy. If you have a problem with your car and you're just saying like, yeah, my car is busted. And then like you take it to a mechanic and the car is like, and then the mechanic is like, what's wrong with it? And you're like, yeah, I don't know. It's busted. Whereas if you say, yeah, I mean, whatever I drive, I hear this clunky sound or it makes this noise or one of the tires seems way smaller than the others. You guys can clearly tell that like awareness of the problem is very, very efficient at solving the problem. The second thing that you can do is work on the body. Okay. So what I mean by that is we know we have physical sensations. So this is where you can do stuff physically. So I think this is why yoga is good. So yoga improves anxiety, depression. And by the way, this is not just because it's physical. So this is a mind body practice. So in clinical trials, yoga tends to outperform exercise. So exercise is great for anxiety and depression, but evidence suggests that yoga is superior. And even some amounts of trauma. So I've worked with some people who like will do sort of yoga informed trauma programs, and it seems to help a lot. So in addition to therapy and stuff, they add yoga and somehow like, we don't know exactly how it works, but we do have clinical evidence. We have scientific trials where that we'll take a hundred people with anxiety and we'll have 50 of them do yoga, 50 of them do exercise and 50 of them do nothing. And we'll compare the results. And what we'll find is that exercise and yoga outperform nothing and yoga performs outperforms exercise in some studies. So what we mean by that is like work on the body. So there are also meditative techniques that specifically work on the body. So I think yoga is a good example of one. But another thing that I recommend people do is that they breathe into the emotion. Okay. So like if you're feeling, so we can kind of do this very quickly. Okay. So if you're feeling, hold on a second. Let me see. Just how much time we have. Okay, great. So if you're feeling um, if you're feeling a tightness in your chest or a pit in your stomach or a constriction in your throat, um, then all I want you to do is just breathe into that space. So when you breathe in, notice that you can feel the breath in your body. Like you can focus on the temperature. And you can kind of feel the cool air kind of going down and into your body. And literally what I want you to do is breathe in to the tightness in your chest and then breathe out. So it's actually relatively simple. You just focus on that sensation with your attention and then you breathe into it and then you breathe out. You breathe in that coolness and you breathe out the warmth. Like you breathe out that negative energy. And that technique is actually pretty good. Like it literally dissolves the emotion within you. Because remember guys that the, the physical sensation that you have correlates is somewhat equivalent to the mental emotion, right? So if we reduce this, then we're gonna reduce this. That's just how it works. And then, so, we can work on the body. And the third thing that we can do is, is sort of met work on the mind. Yep. What I mean by this, so therapy is a good example of processing emotions, but you can also have like conversations with friends. You can work, uh, so like, you know, this is why what we're training recovery coaches to do. So recovery coaches. You can like talk to people on our Discord. I'm just trying to think about what's available to you guys, right? Talk to people on Discord. And so like you can, you can also do other kinds of, you know, processing activities. Like you can join a men's group or women's group. I pick men first because I think our audience is still like 70% male. Um, 
you can just and in general just a support group. It doesn't even have to be gender specific. You know, if you've got an addiction problem, then you can do something like um, refuge recovery or AA. Or even if you're addicted to video games, you can do CGAA. I mean, they're a good organization. I don't really agree with their methodologies, but not to say that their methodologies are wrong. It's just not what I choose to do. Um, so like, you know, you can do, and you can also meditate for sure. Uh, you could also do other exercises like journal or like writing reflect uh, exercises, right? So like Jordan Peterson's self-authoring program, I think has a lot of emotional processing that kind of comes along with it. Um, I, I would imagine. So I don't really know too much about the program, but uh, yeah, so that there's like this kind of stuff, right? So then like, like then people kind of ask, how do I deal with these emotions? Like, this is how you deal with them. First, you notice them. Second, you work on the body and third, you work on the mind. Um, and so let's go ahead and take, uh, we're going to have time for a couple of questions. Okay. So we're going to do Manny, Seth, Tony, and Connor, and we'll do two questions. Okay. Okay, it looks like we've got Connor. Hello? Hey. Hey. So you gave the example of um, alexamic thick. Are there any other um, examples of emotions besides that? What do you mean besides what? Uh, the one example that you gave, alexamic thick. Yeah, alexithymic. Yes, alexithymic. What other emotions besides that are there? If well, so alexithymia is not an emotion. Alexithymia is being colorblind to your mm -hmm. emotions. Yeah. Yes, sir. Does that answer yeah. your question? I so, think so. so emo emotions are like fear, shame, anger, frustration, yeah. grief, regret. And the problem with people who are alexithymic is that they can't detect any of them. Mm-hmm. Does that work? Yeah, yeah, I think. Does so. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So is it? So is it with like when talking about the brain? Is there like a diff, like a different set of like that kind of uh, philosophy, or is it just that particular? What do you mean by in the brain? Is there a different set of philosophy? Um, let me think. Like, um, so you give the example. Uh, is there? Um, let me think. Is there? Uh, I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say. Do I think? Okay, why don't you take a moment to compose okay. your thoughts? Sometimes it can help to write out your question. And let's yeah. move on to someone else. Connor? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Cool. Um, so lately I've been doing uh, trauma processing and it kind of set off this like chain effect of like uh, oh boy. the opposite of like lack of emotions, right? And so, yep. um, so I kind of got to this state of like, like uh, for instance, I went to a friend's yesterday and had like this initial like just shut down of everything. Like I would like tunnel vision and it, it was sure. like just automatic, right? It was like, an, yep. um, and so that happens quite frequently. Um, video games was actually like, a, it helped quite a bit in the sure. um, kind of like reducing a lot of the physical reactions and stuff. Um, but now I'm kind of in the state where it's like, I don't even know, like I don't feel like any emotions or like if uh, occasionally I'll be like in bed at night and I'll just be super sad, but that's like the only emotion that I can ever feel. Um, and I think like, yeah, so I guess just like how to combat the, or not even combat, but like that automatic response. Cause it's like, almost like, I don't even have a choice in it. It's just like, yeah, you, you don't, you don't have a choice in it. I don't think you should combat it. So what you're doing. So people who have a history of trauma oftentimes dissociate during the trauma and after the trauma and dissociation is an adaptive and protective mechanism, just like video gaming. So when the emotional, when, when, when your garden hose, it's not even a garden hose, it's a fire hydrant. When your fire hydrant is busted open and there's water all over the place, your brain is like, oh crap, let's just shut it all off. So yeah. you're like pulling the plug on like all of the emotional circuits. And that's absolutely protective and, and adaptive. And it's probably because you started like turning that on, 
right? Through doing like tra trauma focused work. Right. So this is ideally where you have an expert, like a therapist who will help you through this because it's really hard to manage on your own. Which I do. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that the issue there is that what you want to do is like bring up emotions in a controlled environment where you feel safe. And then like, it's hard to stop a fire hydrant on your own, but if you've got like two people working together, you may be able to manage some of those emotions. Right. And even as it comes to the sadness, so it sounds like you, you're, you know, your fire hydrant is mostly closed up, but there are some cases where there's like water leaking out, yeah. right? Which is like when you're laying in bed at night and you start to start to feel a sense of overwhelming sadness. So I'd say that all of the things that we talked about, you can do when you feel that. But I would not go like, you know, mocking around and opening up that fire hydrant on your own because your right. body's your body <laughs> yeah. or your mind are telling you, hey, man, that's too much for us right now. Yeah. And and there are other things like, you know, going to a retreat or like going for a hike or things like that can also be really good at emotionally processing. It all happens kind of subconsciously in the in the background. But, you know, a lot of people deal with trauma through like finding themselves kind of activities. Right. Yeah. But I think in your case, um, I think you're actually on the right road. And unfortunately, part of the process of, of processing that trauma, like in order to process the emotion, what we're doing is we're actually shining a light on it. So you experience it more. Mm. Um, and then you can try to sort of explore that sadness a little bit, but be, be careful. I would start really with physical stuff because physical stuff tends to be pretty safe. Cool. Yeah, I can do that for sure. Great question, man. Cool. Good luck to you. By Thank the way. you. Appreciate I'm it. I'm glad you're seeing a therapist. It's, I mean, you're, you know, taking, taking control of yourself and contr taking control of your life sometimes is not a solo player thing. I mean, solo, yeah, it's solo game. It's so. insane. <laughs> awesome. good, good luck to you, man. I wish cool. you the best. Thank you. <clears throat> um, do we have Seth? Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. I'm um, okay. So I just had a quick, I had two questions or I could ask just, I could ask one if you want, but, uh, sure. um, so is there like a thing where over time, like as a child, I generally felt, I don't know if this is Alexa time here or not, but like over time, I felt that emotions and just my general sensations and feelings and experiences have lost like like their potency almost like it almost feels sure. like yeah it feels like um uh you know like i i guess like over time i i even would lose track of like positive experiences because like i would be either maybe too analytical like i would start to notice like oh sure. you're having a good time you're smiling you're laughing and then it would take away from it so it's almost like when you say awareness precedes control it's like awareness also kind of screwed me unless it's like a synthetic faulty form of awareness that i'm you know what i mean like my mindfulness or something yeah. or so what what is that that i that like could you explain that sure so there are two things i think that are going on one is that like i mentioned earlier generally speaking when we suppress emotions we suppress all emotions hmm. right so like what what i want you to imagine that you yourself like you have an internal volume control for all of your emotions and in order to protect us from the bad sounds we're going to turn down the good sounds too because we just we just know how to turn down the volume Mm. So the, what you're describing about like over time, you've lost like a zest for life or things seem to be less fun for you. That makes sense to me. Right. And I have that. I see that experience a lot with video gamers and it's just because they turn down the volume on everything. Yeah. And it's so not even dramatic. Protect. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. It's not even dramatic either. It's it's almost subtle. Like it's just part yep. of the existence. It's it's almost undetectable. Absolutely. Right. So like if you think about it, if if you gradually turn down the volume on your TV over years and you don't turn it back up at some point it becomes normal to have like a muted or very quiet TV. Yeah. Like you think it's max volume, right? You, you don't even recognize that volume control is a thing because it's entirely True. subconscious. You just think that's how the TV works. Hmm. I wouldn't even think that you recognize it's max volume. It's just, you, you don't, you think that that is the only volume that the TV is capable of. It's not max or it's not low. Hmm. It's just the volume of the TV period. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. So, so, so that's one thing that's going on. The second thing that I'm glad you noticed is that this is what happens when you start to develop awareness of feelings is it creates distance between those feelings and those feelings have less power over you. Right. So there's actually a fourth variable to the equation of intention, mm -hmm. or like, you know, intention to complete an action. And that's so the three variables right now are like rational thought emotions and ego. And the fourth one is awareness. And as awareness increases, the value of everything else goes down relative to awareness. And then when you become perfectly uh, enlightened, then your awareness is a hundred percent. And then your actions are, can be like in instantly implemented. Hmm. 
So in your case, you may actually be experiencing both that as you gain awareness of excitement, the feeling of, of excitement kind or not the feeling of excitement, the impact of excitement starts to go down, which is normal. See, I think, uh, yeah, at like an early age, I, I think like cause I wanted to understand, like it was because of social like capital or whatever, like I wanted to be popular in this and that or whatever. I tried to sure. start understanding other people through myself. So I don't know if like I taught myself some type of mindfulness or awareness or something. This was like in seventh grade or like middle school. Um, I tried to start learning, like I would witness what made me feel insecure. And then I would look inside myself to see the process. And then I would try to like reverse engineer it by seeing other people. And so like I started to distance myself from like maybe social interaction in like a weird way because sure. I'm just breaking everything down. Yeah. So that's, that's you stepping away from emotional empathy and stepping towards cognitive empathy. Mm. So your understanding of emotions has become more and more analytical, which in turn increases your color blindness because mm. you can analyze your emotions, but you're not exactly sure like what you feel or how you feel. Yeah. Huh. So I, I think you should continue doing, you know, the mindfulness stuff and it's okay for you to, um, you know, be mindful towards your positive emotions. And it kind of like you, and then over time, as you kind of do that sort of stuff, you can actually start to control how much you want to feel that emotion. Mm. The last thing is like, when you're fully aware, you can kind of choose to jump into the water or get back out whenever you want to. And that's when things get fun. So is the, the like autonomous process that I've created, is it possible that maybe it just kind of filters the positive? Cause like I, I generally feel that it filters out the positive ones and then the negative ones stay. So like if I'm at a party having fun, it'll take, it'll create a distance from the having fun, but it won't, I don't really create a distance to the negative things. I only create a distance to the positive. You, you do create a distance to negative things. The difference is that your, your amount of positive emotion is like 10 and your amount of negative emotion is 90. Oh. And you're subtracting 80 from both sides. Gotcha. So it's just that you have more negative emotion built up, which makes sense because you haven't been processing emotion for what sounds like years and years and years and years. Gotcha. So that shit is just piling up. Yep. Got it? Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. All right. Good luck, man. Thank you. Okay. Um, Micah or Tony? Micah, you ready to give it another shot? Or I, we... I think so. So, um, okay. um, um, is there a word or phrase that identifies certain groups of emotions that you feel are suppressed or whether it be um, like the fear or whatever that might be? So I, I don't think that there are groups of emotions okay. that you suppress. I think, like I said, alexithymia turns down the volume on all of your emotions. So I, yeah. I and, and so I, I don't think that there's like different, it's not like there's a different word for like suppression of anger and shame mm -hmm. and a different word from suppressing like happiness and excitement. I think it's just suppression. So it's just all of them in general. All so of it them. can't be a specific one that you just feel like, no. I mean, it could be, right? So your brain mm -hmm. could have adapted to being very good at suppressing a particular emotion. Mm -hmm. Like it's possible, right? So like the, yeah. the guy earlier who was talking about trauma, there are yeah. some things, for example, that trigger dissociation. And that dissociative process could be triggered by specific emotions. In fact, we know that. Mm -hmm. So like, that's what the idea of triggers. So your brain can fine tune to a particular thing. And I guess the closest thing to what you're describing is trigger would be the yeah. word that I yeah. use. Yeah, yes, sir. yeah. Yeah. So I, actually, now that I think about it, I mean, yeah, but I, I don't think there's a specific word for like yeah. suppressing anger. Oh, okay. But your, your brain can trigger dissociative or suppressive mechanics with some emotions around more so than others. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Great question, man. Tony, you around? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. So my question is, is kind of dealing with like previous emotions. So uh, I kind of resonate a lot with your story in terms of I had struggles with college and dropped out. And like my thing was to basically completely dissociate to the point of like not even eating or like it was bad. But now I feel pretty good. But to use your analogy, it feels like I kind of just like leveled up past the debuff so i still feel like i have that like yep like some scar there so how to deal with that when like i feel pretty good i made a lot of progress but it's still holding me back yeah so i think first of all i agree with you that it is holding you back mm -hmm. right so you're doing pretty well and what i'm telling you man is like once you cleanse that debuff 
Mm-hmm. You're going to be like an absolute beast in real life. Mm-hmm. So I think you should absolutely work on that, right? Just doing good in life is not actually like what we're shooting for. We're shooting yeah. for cleansing all the debuffs. Mm-hmm. And where you end up is where you end up. But like as long as those debuffs are there, you should work on them. So the question is how? So I think, like I said, you know, there are a lot of different things that you can do. I think uh, therapy is a great example of something that you can kind of talk to someone about when you were feeling bad and work mm-hmm. through and process those emotions and tell your story and things like that. I think narrative is another good example. So, um, you know, doing narrative exercises about like sort of just writing about that time of your life will probably bring things up for you mm-hmm. and you'll feel that emotion and then it'll kind of affect you and then it'll kind of like wither away. Yeah. So the other thing I want you guys to remember about emotions is like, you don't feel them forever. So if I, if I'm walking down the street and then, you know, I get scared of a dog, I feel so, that dog creates a certain amount of fear in my mind. Like let's say it creates a fear of 20. And then the more I feel that fear, the more that fear kind of goes down because our mind naturally, like you don't stay scared forever, right? Our mind naturally sort of processes, processes that fear. and We return to equilibrium. And the problem is that we feel 20, we process two, and then we store 18. And the next day you're, you're failing out of college. You feel more shame. So you get plus 20 shame, you process two, and then you bank 18. And so what you have is like, you have all this banked stuff, which all you have to do is like process it and feel it. And like, you can breathe into it or whatever. I don't know if there's some way that you can evoke it. Can mm-hmm. you evoke the feelings that you used to feel? Uh, it's very much like, like it's completely blanked out. It's almost like I was thinking about this the other day. Like, I don't even remember like, like any of that. And I try not to think about it at all instead of processing it. So I probably could, but it's, like it's difficult because I don't want to feel that crap that I felt. Yeah. So if you're, if you're not, so I, I would really say like in your situation, you should work with someone, mm-hmm. right? So that can be a, a, a coach through us um, or a therapist. And, and it kind of depends on, on, you know, whether you have a clinical diagnosis that you want to work on or not. Cause if you have a clinical like a diagnosis, like PTSD or trauma or things like that, then mm-hmm. that's really something that you should see a mental health professional mm-hmm. about. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, would say like, it's hard to do it solo. Like the other thing that you can, I mean, if you want to do it solo, I'd say the things that you can do, you can try, try journaling. So you can just start by writing about that part of your life mm-hmm. and then kind of focusing on the feelings. So what are the emotions that you felt? Um, and then the other thing that you can do is just continue to meditate and do yoga and stuff like that. And then you'll start to process those emotions on your own, because remember that your body like naturally wants to return to a healthy state. And you don't have to like, if you get a cut, like you don't have to direct the healing. You, your body's just, you just don't have to get in the way. Mm-hmm. And if you facilitate healing by like, you know, keeping it clean and stuff like that, and just kind of practicing positive stuff. If you do yoga and meditation for a period of two or three years, it'll clear out a lot of that crap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Awesome, man. Thanks for your question. Good yeah. Luck. Thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. So. All right, guys. So we're um, going to wrap up for today. I'm sorry. We don't have sort of as formal of a meditation practice. Um, hopefully you guys can do sort of that breathing into the, the chest or just breathe into that part of your emotion. Um, and a combination of, you know, we got a little bit interrupted, but I really do have to run, but we'll see you guys tomorrow. Let's do a quick poll. Um, what do you guys want to talk about tomorrow? I, I think uh, communication was at the top of the list. We can do Ayurveda. We can do, what else can we do? Um, like mental health stuff. So we can talk about, you know, my perspective on depression or ADHD or trauma. Um, we can do mechanism of the mind so this is understanding like what are the pieces of the mind um or we can talk about covid just how to manage yourself and communication is like how to talk to people okay so it's still looks like it's predominantly communication Okay, I, I can get behind that. All 
All right, so it looks like it's heavily in favor of, of communication, um, but that the mechanism of mind, Ayurveda, and mental health are evenly split. Um, insecurity, ego. Okay, let's, let's try this again. Okay, I'm just gonna knock COVID off the list and let's put ego in there. See what happens now. Oh man, it's close. Looks like ego is winning. Okay. So we have a new winner, which is ego. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So we may still do communication. And the reason for that is because um, I'm just thinking through what order to do things in that kind of, so I don't want to treat things like individual topics, right? I want things to build on each other. And I think talking about emotions and then link, like I wanted to do emotions before communication for sure. And so then the question is, is it better to do ego before communication or communication before ego? What's going to be better? So let me think about that. We'll definitely do those two over the next two days. It's just what order we want to do them in. communication with people that have a big ego, right? So then the question is, do you want to do ego first or you want to do communication first? We'll definitely do those two. So thanks for coming, guys. Let me just think about it. Let me think about how I want to structure that and, and which one should come first. But we'll definitely hit both of those up. Um, and Alex, you keep on sending me these gigantic messages, but uh, buddy, I don't, I can't read that during a live seminar. So good luck, buddy. Um, I'll try to get to it if I can. So uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks for coming. And, um, you know, I think uh, we really appreciate all of the donations and stuff on, on Kofi. There was a question about, are we going to continue this? It just depends. So whether we continue this or not, frankly, depends on how much people get out of it and like how many people use it. Right. So right now um, I'm just thinking about how to spend my time and I want to spend my time to do the thing that helps the equation for how I spend my time is, most value for most number of people. So if it's like super, super valuable, like I could, I could work with one person at a time and help them immensely over the course of six months, or I could do a webinar or I could do a Twitch stream. So basically depending on how popular this is, we're going to prioritize it more or, um, how unpopular it is, we'll prioritize it less. So if you guys want to see more of this, then what I'd suggest that you do is you tell people that, you know, or you talk it up or you advertise it for it. Right. So we haven't asked you to do that yet. And I wasn't planning on asking for it, but I'll just let you guys know from my perspective, you know, 500 people or 600 people or 700 people do this and 4,000 people watch our streams. We're more likely to prioritize streams over this. Um, so I'm, we're trying to kind of figure out how to work, but if the numbers for the webinar get higher and higher and higher, then we'll do more and more webinars because that seems to be what, what helps people. So it's sort of a simple mathematical equation. We have a limited resource, so how should we invest it? That that people will decide. Um, so tell your friends. Uh, and then if our numbers go up, then we'll probably do more. But it, at this point, you know, I don't know how much longer. We'll definitely do the two weeks, but then we'll kind of reassess and maybe try something else or maybe continue this. We'll see. So take care, guys.